<laughs> it's going to be great. Anyway, Josh Key. Uh, <clears throat> screen's up. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Josh G, actually. Um, but uh, most people probably don't know me by that name. Uh, online, I go by Kizrati. Um, you've probably seen that name around. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to talk about today was a couple things. One of the main things is my route to becoming a full-time roguelike developer. It's my job. I make roguelikes. Yay! <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing was basically what I'm doing with my current roguelike. Um, for, uh, so I'll be getting into that. So uh, hopefully it'll be an inspirational to some of you who are thinking about maybe working on your own, because there's definitely a lot of overlap between, the uh, the, you know, between players and developers in the roguelike community. Uh, so um, a little bit of my background. I don't have a CS background. So if you don't have a CS background, um, <coughs> you're in luck. It's still completely possible to make a roguelike and make it your job eventually. <laughs> it just takes a while. English major. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, languages. Um, uh, my background is actually in languages, um, especially ideographic languages, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and, uh, and I studied in Berkeley, uh, classical Chinese. Um, so it's, you know, what I found is that, uh, especially years ago, it was a lot more common for people in like CS departments to work on roguelikes. But now, and especially in the last few years with all the resources that are out there, we're seeing a lot more people um, from all walks of life uh, making roguelikes. And that's kind of where I came from. But I've been doing it for a while and uh, uh, building on my knowledge. Uh, it took a long time, uh, but I'll get into more about that later. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've uh, my entire life I've been a freelance worker, doing translating, interpreting. I've been a fixer, researcher, mostly uh, related to Chinese and my uh, expertise in that area. But it left me with a lot of free time, and I always liked making games of all kinds. And so, among those games. Uh, and so, so programming and uh, pen and paper games, all kinds of games. But uh, so anyway, that's uh, my first game. Um, I actually started when I was really young, but the first major game I started on was in 2006 when my brother, um, just out of nowhere, I, I used to write fiction and I was just spending all my time writing short stories and then my brother showed up and, and suggested, uh, why don't we do a game where our AIs compete with each other? First we have to learn C++ because neither of us knew how to program. <laughs> so. We started that. It was an SRBG. It wasn't a roguelike at all. In fact, at this point in time, I had no idea what a roguelike was. Uh, even despite having played games for a very long time, I used to play MUDs, BBS games, all kinds of text games, but I'd never even heard of a roguelike. Um, not as lucky as many of the people in the audience here. Uh, I still, it's, so in 2006, I still had no idea what it was. But it's kind of interesting if you look at the bottom picture on the left, the first iteration of the game I was working on. Um, it kind of looks like a roguelike. I was using letters to represent things. Um, it was done in a terminal because that's all I could use. And then eventually, it went through these uh, evolutions. And I spent 10,000 hours on this game. Never saw the light of day. It was just a hobby. <laughs> but you learn a lot in 10,000 hours. Um, uh, it was a really big game, way too ambitious for a first uh, serious game. And eventually, so I got to this point, and um, <coughs> so the interesting thing was, so how did I switch from that to roguelikes? Well, uh, I was in the beta stage, almost done with this game, and these little sprites here, I don't know if you might recognize them, they're similar, they're dungeon, crew, dungeon crawl sprites, DCSS. And the, there was a Japanese pixel artist who made all the original ones, Denzi. You know, Santiago. <laughs> yeah, um, he's a great pixel artist. I found his stuff and I put it into my game because I needed something to replace what um, I was showing on the previous page. You can see uh, the letters uh, representing different things. Even in sprite mode, I was doing that, and I needed something to replace it. So. I dropped them into my game, and then one day, uh, after like a year or two, I was like, you know, I'm using these sprites. Where did they come from? And so I found the original game, and I found Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. I'd never even heard of the roguelike genre. I started playing it, and just like that, I dropped my 10,000-hour project, which was nearing the end, and said, I need to make a roguelike immediately. <laughs> It was a really amazing experience. It's hard to express how excited I was during that period. 
Um, that's literally like all I did. Um, I was just playing all these roguelikes and just and many more than this. But these are pictures of actual like my saved games that I pulled. Or some of them are. Some of them I got off the internet. But <laughs> um, all kinds of stuff. You can see Adam, Adam in here, Dwarf Fortress and uh, Xenocide, and Incursion, Mage Guild, a lot of games that uh, many of you have probably uh, played before. Um, I was playing all these games and scouring forums all over the net, looking for people's opinions of these games and basically trying to catch up with these decades of history. Um, so when I was looking uh, for uh, what I could do with, uh, with roguelikes, I decided uh, I was just looking all over the place and I found this, a shout out to uh, Andrew Duell who runs a blog and back in 2008 he had uh, written a post said, why doesn't someone make an XCOM roguelike? And it's one of my all-time favorite games, XCOM. Um, and it's, it's not exactly a roguelike, but um, you know, it has a lot of roguelike qualities. And no one had done that before. So I said, well, I'll start with this. And so I made uh, the XCOM roguelike. Um, I spent about two years on that. Uh, it's really kind of a roguelike. It's not exactly roguelike, but it was a really good starting point for me because I was very familiar with the mechanics. I was very familiar with uh, XCOM. Um, and so I was able to spend my, I was able to focus a lot on the technical as aspects and the usability. Usability is very really important to me, so I wanted to make it so, you know, how can you represent and make it easy to interact with? This is actually a 3D world with multiple levels in a roguelike, in this kind of interface. Um, so I was able to work on that, and uh, <clears throat> so it wasn't too overwhelming, because it's easy to get overwhelmed early on in roguelike development. There's just too many things to do. So what a lot of people do for their first roguelike is just take their favorite thing and make it into a roguelike. You've seen a lot of examples of that kind of thing. Doom RL. Um, <laughs> all the things that end with capital R, capital L. <laughs> There's so many of them out there. Um, and so that was really good. Uh, I finished the Battlescape part. If you're familiar with um, XCOM, that's the uh, part on the ground, not the Geoscape uh, campaign mode. But it was a lot of fun. And what that really did is help build um, <coughs> help build a community. And you really need to build a community if you're going to uh, have a successful roguelike. I mean, that community can build itself, but it's easy if you, for example, in this case, I gave them the tools to build their own. Um, in, uh, uh, with mods. So uh, during that two-year period, I, um, I started branching out. This is the two-year period, two period I was working on XCOM, the roguelike, and I wanted to build a new engine, come up, uh, build a new game, new tools. We'll get into each of these in a second. First thing I did was make my own engine. I was originally using an engine called uh, LibTCOD, which is a really good engine if you're going to roguelike development. A lot of people start there. Um, and so I, I built my own engine with these features. No need to go into them in detail. but. Um, because all I was using from LibTCOD was uh, the uh, console output. Um, and so I needed something that could was a little more versatile and could fit in with all the stuff that I'd spent many years. Uh, I'd spent that 10,000 hours working on earlier. I had such a large library of things I could use, but I couldn't. they weren't very compatible. So I built my own engine. That um, Then I wanted to participate in 7DRL. A lot of people here probably know what 7DRL is, a seven-day roguelike competition once per year. Um, and it's a great competition where hundreds of roguelike developers now uh, get, uh, get you know, spend an entire week working on their, uh, a new game. And um, so I really wanted to participate in that after having been a part of the community and seeing how vibrant it was. Um, so I wanted to do a game based on Battletech, but I didn't have a hex engine uh, for, uh, to use for that. So instead, I came up with my own idea. And um, I'm glad I did that. But we'll get to why I'm glad in a little while. Um, so I was in Thailand at the time, and just all my notes were written on paper. I spent a lot of time planning. It's a seven-day roguelike, but I actually spent over a month planning what I was going to do with it. Otherwise, it would have been impossible. Um, it was uh, way too ambitious of a game. <laughs> Uh, spent a very long time planning it. Oh, uh, and the impetus was um, I was we were in a uh, I was with my brother at a at a hotel there, and we were on the internet surfing around. And someone I saw a, a, a message on a forum. Or, uh, somebody had posted uh, just a single sentence: "What if you could take the parts of your enemies and uh, and make them a part of you, and you know become bigger and bigger and, and more and more powerful?" And that's exactly what Cogmind is really. That's where the idea came from originally. Um, that really interested me. I said, "Yeah, I could I could do this." Um, in a week. Uh, oh, that was a crazy week. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I was pretty much working uh, constantly during that entire week. It was, uh, it was really hard. Um, you don't have to put this much effort into a seven-day roguelike if you're thinking of doing one. Some people only spend a day or two, or maybe a few hours each day. I was working morning till night almost every day uh, until like 2 or 3 a.m. and then get up at 6 a.m. and start again. So I, it was, 
a lot of time put into this roguelike and the planning paid off. So it, it and I spent another two months um, improving it over time, uh, mainly just fixing it, fixing problems. And all this came from the uh, Bay 12 forums. Uh, you know, uh, Tarn, who uh, uh, just gave a talk, his, his forums are amazing. The community there, uh, their feedback is great. They're friendly. Uh, a lot of roguelike fans, obviously. Um, so that's really where Cogmine thrived. There was a tournament there. And then I said, OK, well, I'm done. This is a seven-day roguelike, so we'll put that on the wayside. It's time, for, uh, time to get back to my other game, XCOM. Um, so I continued working on it after that for another year. Um, so that was the second year. And then, so another thing I've been working on is uh, uh, Rex Paint. This is, uh, well, it's, it's done, but I continue adding features to it. It's an ASCII art program, um, but it has so many more uses than that, I discovered. Uh, I found out there wasn't really anything that had all the features I needed for this. Um, so. Um, I built this uh, program, which is like Photoshop for roguelikes, Photoshop for <laughs> ASCII art. <laughs> it's got a whole lot of features, and there's just a small example. You can see on the website a whole bunch more of art, and uh, that some artis artists pick it up. Roguelike developers use it. Like this on the bottom left is just a mock-up that was done a few weeks ago by one of the users. Um, so it's a really good tool for uh, roguelike development as well as art. You can use it for mock-ups. Um, for mapping, and I use it in every aspect of Cogmind. I'm opening this program every day. Um, <coughs> so uh, community uh, is really, really important uh, uh, when becoming a developer. Uh, for me, it was uh, well, without the community, without the roguelike community specifically, too, uh, I would not be where I am today. Um, and if you asked me a few years ago, I would totally not expect I'd be here now. But the community is just so friendly um, and uh, helpful. Uh, mature, uh, but during all my time before XCOM, when I wasn't developing roguelikes, I was completely avoided social media, and this is a big problem uh, for developers, especially if you're starting out, because there's so much you can learn if you go out there and interact with people, and that's something I did not do until I started gradually blogging and blogging more and more, writing lots of articles, development articles, uh, articles about you know the things I had discovered about roguelikes and roguelike development. I do a lot of that. I still do um, hundreds and hundreds of articles over the years. And then I found Reddit through people who were posting uh, about my games. Um, again, starting back with XCOM and uh, browsing forums. Uh, basically, uh, the important thing is to you know have uh, have your hand on the pulse of the roguelike world because. Uh, by looking through all this social media, I was able to um, you know, understand what people, uh, um, you know, what everyone's varying opinions, because there's so many different opinions about roguelikes, there's so many things you can do with roguelikes, and so many different viewpoints. So with, um, and you can't think of them all yourself, so it really helps to interact with the community. Um, this is, again, from a developer's perspective. I mean, players can argue back and forth, but developers really should also listen to all sides and take it all into account when uh, developing and working on uh, a new roguelike. So um, then came my turning point in uh, 2013 when uh, we decided to have a kid. And that changed everything. This has changed my entire calculus. Um, it was uh, basically now or never. I decided that because of the way you know our, our lifestyle was working and, and work-wise and whatnot, I either had to continue working and pretty much drop my favorite hobby, um, which was basically freelancing a little bit and doing a lot of roguelike development. Um, I'd have to stop that development in order to get a, a better job uh, more full-time work, and I would just wouldn't be able to, to uh, develop roguelikes at the pace I would want. So I decided I really had to, uh, I'd have to make it full-time. Um, so that, when that was only made possible by this years of building a community, by working on these other games um, by, uh, in, in the past. So it really took a long time to get to this point. I would never recommend that anyone just jump right in and do this. Uh, <laughs> um, so my idea was to turn my 7 DRL, the 7 day roguelike Cogmind, uh, into a small game. So I did, I just, yeah, <laughs> I, I decided I wanted to turn it into, a, uh, I wanted to do that because um, it would be easier. I figured I could finish it in a year. Um, here's the cumulative hours I've spent working on Cogmind for the past three and a half years. We're approaching 6,000 hours. Um, but we're getting close to 1.0. <laughs> uh, so it ended up being, it, it ballooned. Uh, not really feature creep per se, but uh, well, 
is going to talk about that. Why are we not at 1.0 yet? Well, first of all, the first iterations of the game, people really liked it. And I saw the potential for a lot more. Um, so I really wanted to continue developing for that reason without just saying, okay, I'm done. I could have, if I'd just taken the original 7DRL and polished it, it would have been done pretty quickly, within a year for sure. Um, and I also wanted a really impressive first commercial game. Um, and a lot of people say your first commercial game will fail. Uh, I don't want that to be the case here because that would mean I'd have to quit. Um, and yeah, so there's always more you can do with a grand roguelike. This was, uh, the idea for Cogmind can really be expanded. Um, and the other reason is I have greater goals for what I'm doing in general, both with Cogmind and uh, community-wise. So one is I like to share all my methods to help other developers. I write a lot about development. If you want to check out my blogs or come visit us on the Roguelike Dev subreddit, um, there's a lot you can learn, both from me and others. Um, so I enjoy doing that, and I like to keep doing that as long as I can. And the other one is to expand the Roguelike audience. Um, that's kind of what Cogmind is aimed at, is um, well, I'll get into the details in a second, but in general terms, um, well, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so how can we expand the roguelike audience? This is kind of the uh, second part of this uh, talk here. Um, polish is important. A lot of roguelikes aren't too polished. I mean, you see a lot of the 2D and 3D roguelites and all those games coming out, but all the other ones, they of often... Um, um, people wouldn't generally describe them as polished. And so I, what I wanted to do was create what people would consider a polished roguelike. Um, so how do we do this polish and then polish some more? And uh, really a whole lot of polish <laughs> and uh, even more polish. So that's, what I mean. that's why it's taken so long, too. I work on a feature and just make sure it's perfect. Um, it's the problem being a perfectionist, but we're still approaching 1.0. So <laughs> um, important features. Um, so there's, uh, these are the important features that I think a lot more roguelikes need to do in order to capture a wider audience. Um, okay, so the first, uh, the f first thing is audio. This is a really big thing, um, I think, that roguelikes need to do. Uh, there aren't many roguelikes that have audio, sound effects, and other kinds of audio. Not, not music, per se, but uh, other kinds of audio that can um, make the atmosphere more immersive. I mean, ASCII is awesome, and uh, um, the idea is, um, you know, it relies on your imagination, and sound effects can support that imagination without hijacking it like visuals do. So I really think a lot more developers need to work on audio. So I want to show you real quick the, uh, a trailer as an example of that, just the first minute and 20, if we can hear it louder so we can... So, yeah, that's good. Thanks. So, oh, kind of relax there. <laughs> okay, so that um, that gives you an idea of the audio aspect. That's really what I wanted to show you that for because I need a video to show it. And the trailer is a kind of easy way to do it. So, uh, in like Cogmind has, um, so it's for immersion. Um, Cogmind has over 1,000 uh, sound samples in it. Um, most indie games have maybe a couple hundred. Uh, most roguelikes have about zero. Um, <laughs> so the idea is to build a very immersive atmosphere through sound. Um, like down here, I can't see everyone on the brightness, but there's um, 
a lot of uh, this shows the ambient sound different objects in the world gen uh, produce ambient sound that you can hear different types of machines um, I only have a few samples of it in the game right now I'm gonna drop them all in uh, when it goes 1.0 but um, <clears throat> that helps with uh, you know you can hear different things around the corner um, based on their distance and direction so audio is really important um, so an accessible and intuitive UI is something else that a lot of roguelikes need to work towards. Um, <laughs> okay, so mouse support is super important uh, if we want to expand the audience. Uh, you can see here, this is some data. I'll show you, be showing you a little bit of data from my uh, players. So um, keyboard users um, are still in the, are in the minority. You can play Cogmine with only the keyboard, even though it requires, you can use, it uses every single key on the keyboard, and there's like 300 commands. But uh, they're pretty intuitive, actually, for, key, uh, for, <laughs> for, uh, for key, pure keyboard players. But, you know, you, generally, you have to gradually move into that. So first, you make sure every single thing is accessible via mouse. Um, and just for the heck of it, I put up, these are the different forms of movement input that people use. Majority are numpad. Uh, the smallest amount is uh, the VI keys, HJKL. Um, can see that there. There's a drag and drop interface. Um, there's no reason to not have that if it's easy. Um, I mean, you can just drag things around. Dr inventory management is all managed by drag and drop. Uh, it can be anyway. I mean, again, the keyboard is faster for all these things, but for people with a mouse, this is just natural. It happens so easily. You just click on something and drag it somewhere, and it goes where you want. Um, context help is another big thing uh, for, user, for accessibility. You can just click on a stat and it tells you, you know, what it does. That's pretty all these things are common in non-roguelike games. But what we need to do is take all these non-roguelike things and put them into roguelikes. There's just no reason not to, um, especially if you can do it while still keeping the roguelike a roguelike. And there's nothing that's not roguelike about Cogmind. Um, uh, player convenience, so auto-labeling. Uh, every new object that come into view, they're automatically labeled. Why not? I mean, why make someone use a look command to go uh, somewhere else, you know, to find out what everything is? Uh, that helps, especially in Cogbine, because there are a lot of objects out there, lots of parts lying around. Once you blow something up, it explodes into its parts, and you can just pick up those parts and use them. And so robots and parts and objects, they're all just labeled as you see them. You can, and these are all optional. You can turn that off if you want. You can change the duration. Um, it makes playing really easy. New players can get in, uh, uh, get into the game very easily. Um, they don't have to look anything up. Uh, inventory sorting, just another uh, uh, useful feature. A lot of automated features, basically things that the player might want to do, but you can do it for them automatically. Um, this is your player, player presses a key and uh, everything's sorted automatically for them because no, you know they throw things in your inventory. Um, they can appear in different places. Uh, data visualization. The different ways to look at stats. Can't really see it in the light, but on the right here, there's bars, colored bars, different colors. And there's all kinds of different ways you can visualize and compare your uh, items um, based on all, all different kinds of data. So um, it allows you to play more efficiently, if it, and everybody likes efficient play. Uh, smart inventory management is another one. Um, there are decisions in roguelikes which are kind of no-brainer. Um, like you have a, a damaged item, and you would like to, and you find a n less damaged item of the same type. Well, obviously you're going to want to replace it. Well, so a single key can do that. It picks it up, puts it in your inventory. I mean, puts it, attaches it to you. In Cogmind, you can attach a lot of parts. Attaches it to you, um, drops the one that was attached. It might replace something in your inventory. Drop that. It does everything automatically. These are things that you would have to do as the player, but um, it can do that for you. Um, and that does not to say there aren't any decisions. There are tons of decisions to make in Cogmind. The these are, these are solutions for problems that appear in particular to the mechanics. Um, tile set is incredibly important for a roguelike. Um, roguelike, uh, or Cogmind data, this is the recent data, so the numbers of 66 players recently were using tiles versus 18 uh, in ASCII mode. Um, so you always want tiles if you're building a roguelike. There's, again, uh, more people will play. Um, but the tiles do kind of keep the ASCII characteristics. They're all monochrome. They're kind of identifiable by shape. These are ASCII characteristics, which I think, which I think are pretty important to keep uh, um, uh, to keep when you're uh, working on a tile set. If you wanted to retain that roguelike aesthetic, so pixels are by Casper Wozniak. Look him up if you need some uh, pixel work done. He's awesome. So particles, um, particles, and this is a lot of most people who've seen Cogmine remember this if they remember anything. Um, <laughs> is the fact that there are a whole lot of particle effects. Um, 
and uh, they're relatively smooth in Cogmind compared to other roguelikes. You've seen them in roguelikes before, but not quite like this. Um, <laughs> because, I'll get in the tec uh, technical reason for that would be, <clears throat> there are uh, there is there are two grids. You can only see one of them. You see the terminal grid. It's an emulated terminal, like you would see in a console, a terminal console. There are actually another one. It's much finer, um, but you never see it. You don't even know it's there. It's only used for logic. It's where there is a particle engine that sends particles shooting around on those grids, and it's each cell, each space is actually nine by nine. It's a nine by nine space, so cut like a tic tac toe board, and particles are moving around in there, and they stack on each other, and make everything seem more smooth. But everything is still one color per tile. It doesn't break that rule. So it seems like a, it's a consistent roguelike aesthet aesthetic, um, but on the underside, it uh, works a little differently. The UI is the same thing. You can animate the entire U uh, uh, UI using the same, uh, the same technique, is to split everything into smaller uh, pieces and, sh and use particle engines. Um, Cogmind's main UI has something like 200 particle engines on the same screen. Um, all working on different parts of the screen and elements. Um, and so this is kind of thing that, you know, more, any, um, more roguelike developers should, if they can, do this kind of thing. Because obviously this is attractive, it's attractive to more mainstream audiences, and it doesn't take anything away from the experience. If anything, it, in this case especially, it's a game about robots, it enhances the theme. You are this robot, and so you see everything through these animated interfaces. And uh, so gameplay is another thing. Roguelikes don't need any help with gameplay. That's like the bread and butter of roguelikes. Um, all roguelikes are, have their own unique gameplay. That's not a problem. So it's at the end in, in parentheses. Um, so yeah, in Cogmind, this is an ex these are examples of, for example, the, the unique gameplay of Cogmind. It's, it's a living world. It's not actually you're going around bumping and killing everything or running away from things that would bump you and kill you. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, there's most things out there actually doing their own tasks. These are robots uh, rebuilding walls, building new tunnels. The world is alive. Um, so that's one of Cogmind's uh, draws. And there's also uh, story is another element, but I'm going to run out of time. So uh, it's working so far. Um, this is older data. But um, and Cogmind is not on Steam yet. Uh, but in the first year, it brought in uh, $62,000, which is pretty good. Um, you can see all the specifics. In the data. I've written about all this in great detail on my blog. If you want to read about all these different things, those articles are there. Um, yeah, since then, it's gone up to like 75. So it's just enough to keep working. You know, that seems like a lot, but and it is for a for a traditional roguelike that looks like this. That is very surprising. I was surprised, and that's why I'm still working on it. Though I would have quit if it, not quit, but I would have reached 1.0 if it wasn't like this. But it's just enough to keep going. So I will keep going. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> um, you, if anyone here who's interested in developing a roguelike, there's just so many resources now to do that. Uh, there's the roguelike dev subreddit. Uh, a lot of friendly developers, um, and any if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask me, email me, contact me. However, I'm on a lot of social media. Easy to find uh, Grid Sage Games or Kizrati, and um, and just take those. So the resources are there. You just really it takes dedication. You just have to spend a long time, and I, not as long as me. I made the mistake of not. Um, not interacting with the community early enough, so it's taken me longer than it otherwise would have. But uh, you have to do it for the love of roguelikes. And Brian, who's probably he's in the other room right now, but shortly before coming here, <laughs> um, he basically summarized my talk in uh, one sentence. <laughs> From unpaid to poorly paid, the roguelike hero's journey. <laughs> it, it took what was my hobby and made it into my job. But you know, uh, like it, that's, that's excellent revenue for year one, but I've spent uh, over three and a half years working on Cogmine now. So it's barely enough to scrape by. And my hope is that once it's on Steam, it'll bring roguelikes to a much wider audience. And um, already today, more than one person here has come up to me and said that Cogmind was the first non-roguelite roguelike they played. Uh, they, they played a lot of roguelites, and they, they, you know, the, Cogmind is pretty easy to get into, and they got into this. And you know, from there, you can continue moving towards other roguelikes. So it, it'd be really nice if other roguelikes could start incorporating some of the features that I listed. Um, oh, okay, so, sorry, that was uh, a lot to say. Questions? <laughs> Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah, 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 all right, perfect timing then, excellent. I had a lot more to say, and I was kind of like, whoa. That's <laughs> so great, perfect thanks. timing. Any questions then afterwards or later, I'll be here. So. Afterwards, you thanks. can find Josh. Big round of applause to Josh. Thanks. Uh,